today in the studio, folks, I got a badass artist, Anthony Ricciardi. What's happening? What's going on? Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here. Dude, if you guys don't know this dude's artwork, man, go check it out. RicciardiPaints.com. It's R-I-C-C-I-A-R-D-I paints.com. Go check out his shit. I don't mean shit. I mean <laughs> the goods. He always incorporates hearts for some reason. Yeah. I want to to find out why, but you're more than an artist. Uh, You know, your buddy says you're quite the entrepreneur as well, but you got, uh, you got stuff hanging in a lot of different areas, showcasing artwork all over the place. You do murals. You got, uh, what's this say? You got fricking people owning your shit. I own a piece. Yes. It's an awesome piece, by the way. Custom. Anybody wants a custom commission piece? I'm telling you, dude. They are bad ass and, and, and you incorporate well people's personality into the paintings. Yep. Yeah. I got my sayings in there. There's a little winking Benjamin for money. Yeah. Dude. But, but, but there's also hearts. Yep. And, uh, everyone it's downstairs in my training center. It's going to be in my home uh, uh, soon, but, but I've left it there. Nice. Everybody goes, dude, that's badass, And a lot of people recognize you. Oh, amazing. They're that's like, awesome. dude, that's that dude with the hearts. And, and that's what they always <laughs> say. Yeah. Cause you got hearts everywhere. Yeah. It's almost like you got a heart on. <laughs> why, why the hearts? So, you know, my quick story is I, I went to school, I'm from Toronto, Canada. I went to school in Alabama on a baseball scholarship because growing up, no one really said, you know, become an artist. That's something that's a viable career. Um, so I went to school on a baseball scholarship and studied finance. Um, you know, growing up, I had a couple of people in my family that were in finance and, you know, making money is never a bad thing. So I said, okay, let's, let's get into finance while working in finance almost every night and weekend I was painting. And I would always tell myself, follow your heart and good things will come. But I worked in finance for about five years before making that transition. So for me, it was always follow your heart, good things will come. And I started to put it on my studio wall. I was painting in a greenhouse in my parents' backyard at the time. And on the wall, I would write, follow your heart. Finally, I'm like, why don't I try to put this in a painting? And people started to connect with it. They said, well, I want to follow my heart too and do what I love. And that sort of, you know, started to roll into this, you know, this whole entire concept that I developed, which is when you follow your heart, incredible things happen. And I know sometimes, especially someone from the finance world, entrepreneur, like that I like to call myself is that it's very airy fairy. Oh yeah. Follow your heart. Good things will come. Like following your heart with hard work, with planning, with determination does equal whatever you want it to equal. So that's where the hearts come from. And I always try to include it in my pieces because I want like my true identity and feelings to come through every piece. So, it, yeah. so the hearts are there because it's, it's that you love painting. I love painting and I, and I, you know, I love doing what I love to do, which in any moment it is that singular piece. When you, get commissioned by people because because you've got like Shaq, Post Malone, brands like Bad Bunny, celebrities left and right, brands like Disney, Adidas, Coors Light, L'Oreal. Yeah. Like they obviously see your painting and then say, I want you to create something for me. Yeah. Do you think at the heart is the big thing? I uh, No, I think I'll, I'll, there's a bunch of different layers to my pieces. So the, the number one layer is like the depth and texture that I use in all of my pieces. And we can go into that. I'm, I'm actually colorblind, which is a, a fun spin for, to being an artist. Um, so I work in layers. So as I'm working with the color, I'll let the color dry, then add the next layer. So as you'll see, even in the painting you have, the texture and depth of the piece is very thick. So I'm able to tell a story through that. The second thing is the writing that I add. So all of my paintings have some quotes, especially when we do something custom, I'm able to add like their personal quotes or a personal date or a birthday, whatever it may be hidden inside the painting. So that's the second layer. And then the third layer is whatever the main focus is going to be. And then that always is tied into a heart because I want to, even if we're doing something as iconic as Mickey, like I've done for Disney, or if I'm doing a Benjamin, or if I'm doing an old um, Marilyn Monroe, I'll incorporate the heart into my style. So it's, it's like an ode to everything that they have done and everything that the iconic figures done but in my style now if you do if you do a piece where mickey mouse is on there you got to pay disney so i have a really funny story when i first started doing mickey um everyone like friends and family like no don't like stop disney's gonna come after you like like absolutely not and and then all of a sudden i kept doing it and there's a a good friend of mine uh, joe gliese runs a company called viral nation they they run the marketing for disney um experiential marketing and he reaches out to me he's like disney loves your stuff i'm like I, th- I thought I was about to be sued. I didn't, I did not expect Disney to like what I was doing. I was taking my rendition of it. 
But um, so they ended up hiring me for a project, went down to Epcot, did a big mural and big painting um, for Disney in Orlando. And it's been a great relationship since. But but yeah, I, there is that worry when you're, you are using, you know, public imagery, but always, you know, with the best intentions in mind, I'm never degrading or, you know, any defamation to any of these pieces. I'm always trying to uplift and highlight all the beauty that they have. Well, so the answer is no. The answer is you don't not have to pay me, to not paint. for me right now. Right. But if someone else <laughs> would they say, Hey, quit using, quit using. Mickey? I, I think it could happen. Cause yeah. I know another artist, uh, that, that paints Mickey's and I'm always wondering like, how does he get away with that? Yeah. Maybe Disney doesn't care. Or doesn't know. I, it's a little bit of both. And then also there's a thing in art where if you're changing the painting, I believe it's more than 25%. So if I'm taking Mickey, but his ears are dripping, the color of his clothing is a little different. The, the way that his face is shaped is a little bit different. And I can prove that a lot of it's been changed. Um, that is a thing, but it's still a very fine line. Um, yeah. and you know, these big corporations have tried in the past. Andy Warhol is one of the most famous ones who who all these brands came after. Campbell's Soup was one of the biggest ones. That's Andy Warhol's most famous painting. But no one knows before he became famous with that, Campbell's was coming after him left, right, and center with lawsuits. Like, you can't do this. Eventually ended up being that the big corporation looks like they're attacking a, an artist. And that doesn't look good for anybody's PR. And then ultimately, it helped Campbell's Soup. Because now Campbell's Soup's on everybody's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of walls in their house. And when they're in the grocery store, it's subliminal marketing. So I think a lot of brands have realized that it could be good. It's helpful. Um, it's helpful. Like if I had a brand, so, you know, known and people started snatching it and doing stuff with it, like it would, it's marketing to me. hundred percent. Just like videos. Like if you go to my YouTube channel, I want you to share a million videos, yeah. even though they're mine. I don't care. Share it, share it, share it's it. You. You're out there. Yeah. 100%. It's marketing. Yeah. Cool. So back when you were a youngster uh, in Toronto, yeah, you were painting in the middle of the night, working a finance job during the day. Yeah. And at what point in time did the painting start outweighing the finance job? You don't do finance anymore. I don't. No, no, no. I You're left straight just artist. over six years ago. Yeah. You got galleries? Yep. Where are they at? They're in Toronto. So I, I have two galleries there in Toronto in uh, Yorkville Shopping Center and then Yorkville, which is two nicer ends of, of Toronto, just the... Um, public areas. And then I do a bunch of different pop-ups. So I'll do a pop-up in LA. I've done a bunch in Miami. Miami's one of the bigger You sell out hubs. when that happens? Um, usually. Because there's nobody that can't like your shit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But no, they, they, they usually go well. Uh, you know, I in those type of pop-ups never have many paintings, 10, 12, 15 max. And then, and like you mentioned, like a lot of custom stuff comes from there. They'll see one piece that I did and they're like, oh, I really like that, but I need it twice the size or I need it twice as small or whatever it may be. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, they've, they've gone well. I've been extremely lucky on that side of things, but when the transition to, to your question was, so during those five years, every night and weekend I painted. And again, it never seemed realistic. Uh, I'm, I was heavily inspired by an uncle of mine. My were, uncle Fab. Were, they, were they this good though? Uh, probably not. No. No, so I, you I got think better, so. you think? I think I, I definitely got better. Yeah, um, yeah. You, yeah. You <laughs> we have a friend here, so he's, he's, my, uh, he's helping out with the did, spokesperson. Did, did, so did, originally, were they just like, you know, a bunch of colors? Because you, you use colors like a son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah I do. But that's um, good. That's what makes them cool. Yeah. Like, like, I pop. like your style of freaking art. Yeah, no, thank you. They, that, that, I think it was twofold. Like initially, I was really trying to find my style. So during those five years, like I was when I say I'm painting every night and weekend, it was just trying things. A lot of those paintings were, were trash. Like a lot of those paintings didn't come. And then the biggest thing for me going back to being colorblind was I didn't really have a, a concept to how to mix colors. Cause I can't mix color cause I don't see shades. So a lot of times I would put blue here, put yellow here, put a little bit of green and it would just make like an ugly Brown. And I would not see it transitioning to ugly Brown. And my wife would walk in or my girlfriend at the time, uh, who's now my wife. She's like, what, what is that? Like, you did not mean to make this all brown and, and black. It's the sky. Like, it wouldn't even make any sense. So I had to just, that's why those years were so, so important to me. And, but, but like go, growing up, it didn't seem realistic. What are you going to be a starving artist? Like, what, like, let's, let's get real. So I kept working to honestly finance all the canvases. Cause at that time I was just doing small pop-ups by myself. So I would, I would host I would rent a little space downtown Toronto and do like, it was just family and friends at the time. Right. I was, I was young and I was like, Hey, aunts and uncles and anyone that wanted to come and support. And, and with that, I was able to take photos and not many paintings were selling and the price points were extremely low. Um, so I wasn't really, that wasn't a viable thing to be like, Oh, let's go do this. The big break. And I guess the big change for me is when 
I started doing outdoor murals. So when I started doing outdoor murals, that was the exposure that I really needed to take that next step. And I got a mural at the, uh, the Soho House, uh, Soho Hotel in uh, the in New York City. Um, it was through a, a friend of mine, Antonio Tedrisi, who runs an incredible architecture firm. And he was he was doing this, and he goes, "I need they need you to do this. They like your artwork." And I I, I remember going to my boss at the time in finance, and I go. Hey, I'm taking off a week. Uh, I'm going to do a mural. And I was so excited. I'm expecting him to be excited. And he's like, you're not an artist. Like, what do you mean? You're going to take off a week. I had, I had, you know, I was, I was an employee. I had vacation hours, but because I said that and he said, you're not an artist. Come on. Like, what are you talking about? And I was like, damn, like, I guess he's right. Like, I'm not an artist. So I'm going to take off work to go paint. And a month later, I, I turned down the mural. It wasn't big money or anything. It was just an opportunity. And I, I turned down the mural and a month later, they, he calls me back on a Tuesday night and Antonio goes, hey, listen, um, they want you to come. So you, you need to come. Like they, the artist they hired isn't moving on. They're not doing it. So they want you to come. And that Wednesday morning, I walked into my boss. I'm like, hey, um, love it here, but I'm going to New York. I'm, I'm quitting to become an artist. And he's like, all right, but that's what I want to do. Let's, let's go. We support you. And, and I just never looked back. Um, and so I had, I always get paid for that. I did get paid. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it wasn't how, much. How much a mural get back then? Back then I, I think it was like 1500 bucks. How long did it take you? Uh, oh, five, six days. Dude, that's a lot, a lot. So how do you know what like to lay down first? Like, do you see the painting in your head before you yeah, make it? Yeah, like a lot of times there'll, there'll be sketch renders, um, not not to specific points, but like they'll have a, I'll have a concept of like what I'm gonna do. And then a lot of it's like, it's just execution. Things change the way paint layers. A, a good story was just two weeks ago, we were in Antigua and I did a big, it was a 70, 80 foot mural on the side of a building, this beautiful luxury resort. Um, called Hodges Bay and I did the render and when when you're there and you're dealing with wind rain and a bunch of different things the paint's going to dry differently than than the render the drips are going to fall as they fall so a lot of things do change but that's why the render is meant to be like a direction for me but it always does change and everything's by hand so you know I'm I'm going as I go what what kind of like costs go in like what does a canvas cost yeah so like in my galleries right now a a five foot by four foot canvas would range between the eighteen to twenty five thousand dollar range. No, I mean like, what's the canvas cost? Oh, what is cost? Um, like a canvas at an art supply store would be around a hundred bucks. So the paint, uh, like thirty forty bucks. So the margins in art is <laughs> they're all right. <laughs> they're all right. See, I always wanted to be an artist because, dude, you could just sit, literally go buy fifty canvases, and anytime you needed money. Yeah. Boom, well, boom, 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 boom. I wish that that sounds easier, but no, well, it's that's a lot. the way it is. If you're it, good, it, 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 it becomes Dude, I, like I, that. You ever, you ever see those art shows where they're they're They got a truck and there's just a bunch of artwork out and yeah. you pull over and you buy them and they're yeah. not, they're not obviously the prints, originals, yeah. but, but dude, those sell all day long. Yeah. Um, if I'm an artist and they're originals, you know, I may not be able to get $20,000 for them. Yeah. But I guarantee you I could slap some shit on there. And go make some money. 100%. At least some money. That's like my, my biggest argument to artists and creatives in general. This goes to musicians. This goes to things. You have to put things out in the world. And and you know this. Like, the more you put out, the more chances you have of it coming back in. So, to your... the point That's right. Where, you didn't hear it, but there's a bomb right Oh, there. nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true, man. I'm yeah. telling you. The, 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 the more you put out, the better it is yeah 100 percent. when it comes to content as well exactly so it, it i had an opportunity to speak to a few different graduating classes from art school i obviously didn't go to art school i went to school for finance and the biggest thing that these artists and creatives as a whole are missing is like they're so focused on the singular painting that they're doing in that moment or the singular piece of content the video how's the quality how's this and the other but as as you know like some of your most viral or, or most incredible videos of hardest impact it you just filmed on your phone or, or I just painted very quickly. I didn't overthink the painting and putting it out in the world and, and being ready to be judged, being ready to, you know, have no one buy it is part of the, you know, the transition. But ultimately, if you do it enough times, something clicks. Yeah. And I think that was, that's, that's really my story. I just did it so much. I painted so many paintings and, you know, kept pushing it out. And I did art shows where nothing sold, of course, right? Like I did, I did shows or I did trips. I went to the other side of the world. I went to Brazil. I went to here that it didn't end up working out how we wanted to, but it all built part of my story. And I think that's the key. Yeah. And plus if you like doing it just because it's fun, it doesn't really matter. Doesn't the matter. money's just a bonus. hundred percent. But now you're starting to make a shit ton of it. <laughs> 
right? Do you get a lot of phone calls from people saying, Hey, we want, we want you to come do this and come yeah. do that. Yeah. It's, it, it's been awesome. Um, if somebody listening loves your work and wants to like hire you to do a commission, yep. are you available still? I am. Yeah. I still do a lot of commissions. The, the, the good thing about having galleries and I have a, I have a big studio. It's like a big old warehouse in Toronto as well that I paint everything in. So I've been able over the last three, four months, um, Unfortunately, during COVID, obviously we closed the galleries in Toronto had got hit with COVID very badly in terms of See, lockdowns. I don't get that. I would have just went online. Like, yeah. So that's I, exactly, I don't need to see it in person. I just need to see it. Exactly. So because I was able to move into the studio space, I was able to build inventory that didn't have to go on walls mm. and I was able to do it. So, um, that leads me into a really fun thing that I'm building. It's going to be ready next week. I built an app. Um, it's the, I think it's the first of its kind in which you'll be able to go download the app. You'll see my entire gallery. You'll pick the painting you want. It'll, uh, with your camera on your phone, you go into your living room and you just, you'll see the painting uh, in augmented reality right on your wall. You can zoom in to see, like literally walk around your house and see how the paintings look on your walls. Can you adjust lighting? Sorry? Adjust lighting? Um, of the canvas, no. You, you'll, it just looks like whatever the lighting is you have in your, in your house going on, the painting is in full res, so it, it shows clear. That's cool. But I think it's going to be really fun because that, that whole scenario of, I, there's been so many times I've brought four or five paintings to a, someone's house where they end up buying one or the size doesn't work. So now I'm, I'm really, that's, that's where the entrepreneurial side of me comes into play. It's like, how can we make this a seamless transaction? So during COVID I moved to online and, and honestly, and I bought a studio so I can do this because people now they're stuck at home and they're not only buying one painting, people that weren't financially affected, of course, weren't buying one painting, they were buying two, three, and four because they realized their their walls are empty. They'd, they'd never spend that much time at home. So because of that, I transitioned into a lot of online sales. And I mean, Instagram has been awesome. And although I don't have a you know massive following, it is deep that they, you know, they like art and they have friends that like art and it's been able to sort of snowball from there. When people do their houses, like for example, do you think it's wise that you buy a piece of art and then you get furniture to match? So I like, shouldn't I, the artwork be the focal point. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I've had a lot of people that have tailored rooms around my pieces and, and, and now at the stage that I'm doing, cause a lot of the pieces that are, are very big, they become, they're starting to become investments for, for families. Um, there I'm going in like pre-construction there. I'm in, I'm in the talks with the architect and designer of the house before they're actually even moving into the house to create pieces <clears throat> custom for their house. Yeah. That's when, so, that's when the shit's freaking awesome. Yeah. So that that's like, especially over the last year or so, especially with everyone doing renovations to their house and all this type of fun stuff. Um, that's a, been a big focus of mine, really tailoring just the overall, cause I've seen how artwork and I, you know, as well, like how artwork can change an entire room. Right. You just put a different type of painting up on that wall and the whole room changes. So I love that experience with clients and, and friends and family. So I wanted to like really amplify that. And that's, that's sort of the next direction for sure. Yeah. And with the, with the colors again, I mean, if that was on my wall, you, you'd want the furniture and everything to kind of match that. Yeah. It's, you don't want to match artwork to furniture. You want to match furniture to artwork. Yep. Yeah. Or a lot of like, a lot of these homes are, if it was, let's say the, the trend of modern, if we were in a modern home, it's like black and white and clean and having this huge pop of color on the wall really makes it feel like a home instead of very cold, you know, which sometimes happens in these, these type of homes. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the goal. <coughs> Would you frame like canvases? Are you supposed to, or no? Um, so I, I'm like 50, 50 on it. I, I think the main thing, the one time that I start framing in clients' homes is if they have multiple pieces of mine, just to differentiate a little bit. Um, I love the, the concept of raw canvas cause I, I paint right around the edges. I make it, I make it a piece. So I like you being able to come over to the side and see like how those drips. Sometimes I do writing, sometimes there's little quotes on the side of the canvas to make it like a full experience framing is beautiful, you know, and it, it all, it all really is dependent on the home. If everything in their home is framed, then you know, I get it framed, but I love raw canvas. And I, I, um, I like the feeling of being able to see the edges and, and see the texture. Well, I've got one in my collection. I'll probably pick up a few more by the time it's all said and done, but I'm, but I'm, you know, looking to build a house, just one bitch and forever home type of thing. Beautiful. And, and I'm going to build it around the artwork. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. To where like, you know, it, that might belong in the kitchen. That yeah. might belong in the game room. That might belong in the living room. Yep. You know, or a big wall when you walk in. <clears throat> yeah, I've done a couple of cool things where, so I, 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 two, three years ago, I started doing murals in people's homes. And then what happened when one client came to me, he's like, I'm moving, what do I do? I'm like, oh, damn, I, no, like, 
I, I, I take, rip the wall out, like keep a piece of it. So then what we started to do was, cause that concept doesn't work. Um, I started building out, I've done it maybe three or four times now for like, you know, custom homes, building out panels of artwork. So I do them on these panels and we insert them into a wall. So it looks like when you're going in, it's a full experience of so the whole walls a mural. But if they ever moved, if something ever happened, they want to like, whatever it may be, they can pop it off the wall and, and bring it to them to the next spot. So that's the beauty about building into a home. We can build things that are like, actually custom for the shapes of the walls and we can do stuff on the floor we can do things in the ceiling we can do stuff that like are really make the home a piece of art especially when you're going to build a custom home it's going to be a piece of art in itself so i saw that you did a little thing with uh grant down in miami yeah what's that thing called it was it was during art basel art basel yeah so yeah, why was, basel oh because in basel switzerland basel is where, mean? it's it's the city in which it was started art and, basel yeah B -A -S -S That's funny. I always you, the word Basil. You ever know somebody named Basil? I've never met. I, I from Austin Powers, but, but you've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why every time I hear Basil, I'm yeah, always like oh, his name's Basil. <laughs> yeah, I'd so, love to have a name like Basil. <laughs> but Art Basil. Yeah, so it's a, it's a huge art event that goes on every year. There's a few different hubs around the world. Miami's the biggest one in North America, um, and a friend of mine, Richard Dolan. He's a he's a stud. He's Richie a, Dolan. Yeah, Richie. No Richie. No. Okay, Richie, yeah. But he, but I know of Richie. Okay, amazing. And, and they call him Richie Dolan. Yeah. yeah you I said see. Richard. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I, well, I want to be proper. Yeah, but, but I mean, I didn't know. Is it Richie? Yeah, same Rich. Same guy? Rich, yeah, same guy. He's awesome. So he, yeah. he's a friend from Toronto, and um, and he's connected me, and a lot of like the NBA guys that I've done paintings for, I'm so grateful that he's been able to put me in contact with their management and them and, and organize. So Grant had done a post that he wanted a small mural in his gym, and then I reached out to Richie and I, I said, hey, like I, you know, he's done a bunch of stuff with 10X and, and Grant specifically. And he put me in contact with Jared and we, we know how awesome Jared is. So right from there, um, a friend and I, Greg here, who's actually with me, we went over to uh, to the office, got to meet him, got to meet Grant and we just started talking. And, and I, so I ended up doing a mural for his gym. And while I'm there, I'm like, hey, I want to do a mural in your podcast studio as well. I just, I'm like, let's do it. And he's like, yeah, let's, let's go. So I, the big, there's a big mural in his, uh, in his podcast studio now, um, where they do a lot of different things. So I did that. And then, um, he was busy. And as I said to Jared, I'm like, I want to meet with Grant, like just one more time. Cause I want to, I have an idea. And we, so uh, we went over to his house, so got to sit down with him for like 10 minutes. And I started pitching the idea of like, we should do an entire 10 X show. So 10 paintings, the main concept was, and obviously I'm inspired by Grant and everything he's been able to build. So the main concept was, I knew all of his big quotes, the center focus of each painting would be a quote of his. And then I would create all of my artwork all around it and make them like unique pieces of art. And we can do prints from there. We can do t-shirts. We can do a bunch of fun stuff. So, so that's how that happened. And we thought it was, it was literally four weeks before our Basel and Grant's like, Oh, we're pretty tight timeline. Can you execute this? I'm like, of course. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's get it done. And I flew back to Toronto the next day. His whole team's incredible at setting up events. Obviously they've set up pretty big events and I, I executed all the paintings, got them rolled up got them brought down and we actually ended up framing them all going to framing because we wanted them to look good in the space they have and executed that entire show in like four weeks and then had a big event during our basil which was uh which was awesome and he mm -hmm. actually releases hit the first batch of nfts um in line with them um which was really cool did did they all sell they didn't all sell um we we sold uh, quite a few i know one's going in grant's collection and one went to jared's and then um a few other pieces they're um they're holding for the the full NFT drop that he's doing. Do you ever wonder like, why the fuck didn't that sell? This is the craziest thing with art. It's so subjective. I've done some paintings that I absolutely love. Like I'm like, this is my favorite painting I've ever done. I put it on the wall and it doesn't sell. And then I've literally done some paintings and I'm, I'm you know, transparent to say this, that took me three minutes. And I was like, I'm just gonna put it up on the wall in the gallery. And someone walks in and goes, oh my God, that's the most incredible painting I've ever seen. I'm like, what? How did this work? It doesn't. So that's the beauty about art and anything creative is that it's just like music. Like some people like some things and some people like other things. And that's so, yes, there's been a lot of times where I'm like, how didn't that sell? But then equally amount of times I've been like, how did that sell? Like I wasn't in love with that painting. And, and usually I don't put something when I say that I wouldn't put something up in my gallery that I'm actually not in love with. But there is things that are stronger than others. If I don't like it, I'm I just scrap it. I just white it out and start again or just throw the canvas away, whatever it may be. Do you do a lot of splashing? 
Yeah, a lot of the base layers, because going back to like the how I started painting, it was abstract. So I was inspired by the Jackson Pollocks of the world and a bunch of different Cy Twombly's who are old abstract artists. Um, and there was there was heavy splashing, heavy brush strokes. So that's how I started painting. I didn't you know, I didn't go to art school. So I, I learned from just research. And so my the base of every one of my canvases is heavy splashes, heavy layers, heavy brush strokes. Then once I have that base, then I start implementing all me. So yeah, I, a lot of splashing, a lot of, my studio is a disaster of paint. <laughs> and how do you, if you can't see color, how do you know what it comes out like? So I, I work in layers and that's where the texture comes into play. So if I add blue, I let it fully dry. It's also why paintings take me a little longer than they necessarily should because I, I, let's say I make a big splash of blue, that blue has to fully dry before I can go to the next color. Because what the only problem I ever come into is if I'm trying to rush a painting. But if I, I mean, I just read the label, it says blue, I splash blue, I let it dry, now I know blue's there. If I wanna splash yellow on the other side, if that's dry, I know yellow's gonna stay yellow. Do you know what yellow looks like? I think, but if you bring green beside it, I'll think they're the same color. So I, I don't see shades. So blue, purple look exactly the same. Uh, green and brown, green and yellow look exactly the same. Red and brown look exactly the same. Uh, purple and black look the same. So pink and purple look exactly the same. So, but purple or like purple and yellow, they look different. I just couldn't tell you if it was blue or purple or green and purple. That's, they look different though. I don't see black and white. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. And you say you're married now? I am. Yeah. So my, my wife's awesome. We've been together since grade 10. So we've been together for uh, 16 years. You live in Toronto. Yeah. How yeah. is that town? Um, but outside of the last two years, I think that our, um, without going to politics, I think they've done an absolutely horrendous job at, at dealing with COVID and, and lockdowns. Um, it's very, very sad to what they, it's been the most lockdown city in I think North America by a landslide. We just, we just lifted mass mandates up, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. We just, restaurants just opened up three months ago, uh, which is like two years of full closures. I, I owned a restaurant in Toronto as well, a, you know, a separate thing that I, on my entrepreneurial ventures, but um, that we un unfortunately had to close down because you can't keep paying staff to be there and ha operating rent when you have no one coming in because they're not allowed to. Um, so I, I, I love Toronto. It's my home and, you know, I think I'll forever live there, um, but the way that the last few years have been, it's put a, a really big damper. And that's why I spent a ton of time in Florida. We've spent a ton, a ton of time in LA um, because Florida was open and I have a lot of friends that live in Florida um, because of university. So I've been able to just sort of travel around and that's the beauty about art as well. And doing something that, you know, where you run my own business that I can sort of do it from anywhere. So to your question, Toronto is awesome. Um, the last two years have put a little bit of a asterisk on it, but it's, it's been, it's awesome. Have you been to Montreal? I have. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, Two years ago, right before COVID, I did a big art show during uh, Grand Prix, which is that one, which is actually this weekend, um, which is cool. Montreal is beautiful, really, really pretty, pretty town. I haven't spent many time, you know, I'll go twice a year, nothing like I it's keep about being four hours away. up there. Yeah, it's by awesome. A girl named Sonia. Okay. Zarbatani. Do you know her? I don't. She's like a fireball. Okay, cool. But she keeps telling me how beautiful Montreal is. Every is. time I see pictures, it's like an old kick-ass looking city. Yeah, it looks like an old European city. It's like, it's it's very, it's it's obviously French inspired and half the people speak um, French, you which speak is cool. French? I don't, um, unfortunately, but it, it, it's a really, really cool, cool area. And especially like old Montreal, old like that whole area where it's all cobblestone still on the streets and stuff. And it's, it's awesome. No really kids? Beautiful. I have, I have one son. Yeah, he's, he's, they're at the hotel having fun. Um, he's one and a half. Oh, sorry, two and a half. Oh my gosh. Does he paint? He does. He makes a disaster in the studio. He's, he's funny. He's, uh, yeah, he's a character. He's, he's me as an adult, but he's two and a half years old. So he's like crazy and always wanted to do a thousand things, but he's awesome. So where, where do you want to take this? Like, I mean, do you want to yes. be, do you want to be like eventually known as a Picasso, Renoir, Monet, Chagall, Matisse? Yeah, so I think that like that style of artist and the that's a, a very traditional gallery style route that went and then went into the the auction houses and such. <clears throat> I think that in the modern day there's there's been so many people like a Virgil Abloh who unfortunately passed away, but he was he's a creative director of Louis Vuitton. He was the founder of Off White, but he was also has paintings and, and artwork in museums like the Museum of Chicago and such. And I really see because of my creativity and love for different things is I want to be you know I'm. I want to be the biggest artist that has ever been here, of course, with my canvas work, and I'll never stop doing that. But my 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 love is in so many different things. Like we talked about 
the housing that we talked about clothing, like I've done a bunch of different things. So where I see myself going in the next five years is I'm going to keep doing art. I'm going to start getting represented by bigger galleries around the world, which to right now I do all my sales. It's, it's me and my wife. Um, she, she works with me and it's awesome. So we, we get to do, I'm dealing with every single client. I'm talking to everybody. And the next step for me is to go into a gallery system that starts selling. Cause I want to, all, while I want to focus on just the painting, I also have a couple different entrepreneurial ventures that, that stem off my artwork. I'm starting a jewelry line called Every Heart, and I've partnered with some incredible people, and we have a really, really strong team that's going to be doing fine jewelry um, that releases in August, which is which is awesome. I'm so excited for, but it's all stemmed on the back of my heart and stemmed on the back of my artwork to now create fine jewelry for the masses because canvases are excellent, but there's only a certain number of canvases I can make, and ignoring the, the monetary aspect of it, I sure I can charge whatever I want for them, but it's not mass market and there's no scale to it. So my, my business mind is like, how can we build something that I can keep creating, keep creating beautiful artwork, but also create scale, create an enterprise and have something that's truly, truly big. So that's, that's my next step is to keep painting every single day. Cause that's what I do. And it's what I love to do and, and have someone run that side of it for me, maybe in house, maybe a third party gallery. And the second step is, is be the creative director that one day bigger brands. So now all the brands that I work with, I do one, one type of thing. So I did an event at Disney. I did an event for L'Oreal and so forth, but I want to go in, in seasonal events to be like, I'm the creative director of Louis Vuitton. I'm the creative director of Prada for, for this, for this series that we're doing while being an artist. So I really think that's the next, you know, talk about five years. Um, that's definitely the next, that's the plan. Um, but my, my main focus is, I just touched upon it, but it's the jewelry. And then second is going to be, uh, and always will be the art. Why jewelry? I, you know, I, I did a release. Um, it's actually this necklace that I'm, I'm wearing here. I did a release with a company called Vitali. They're a, an incredible company based out of Toronto. They sell uh, jewelry worldwide. And we did it during during the pandemic or just just before the pandemic to raise money for social injustices. And I, I went to I went to a historically black schools, at HBCU in Alabama, Alabama State. And we wanted to fund um, historically black schools during all what we have seen go on through the U S and, and Canada, um, in, in equality. So we, we did it as a test. And I said, like, in terms of the, the jewelry, I want to make one piece. I want to make a heart pendant where it's called the heart of gold. And every single hundred percent of every dollar raised would be donated right into historically black schools. And it, it sold out at, at a, at a pace that we could have never imagined. Like in a few hours, we raised eight, eighty thousand dollars and we're like, Oh, this is, this is awesome. And they were very, very affordable. Like we sold these for like 25, 30 bucks and we sold thousands of them. We're like, okay, well people seem to like this. This is, there's actually a, you know, when you have a, something beautiful with a cause, um, I think we can create something beautiful. And, and going back to, we donated even the cost that it made us cost to make them, we donated. Um, and then, uh, Shane and I, so Shane's the founder of Italy and his partner, Jason, we started talking about how can we build this into something even more incredible. And we, we brought, um, a woman named Tanya in. She's, she's our president now. And she's awesome. She has a background in sport. She was on the, you know, team Canada rowing and I would have a background in sports. So we said, what is the, what is the number one thing that we think we can help in if we did jewelry? Because that was where we saw so much success. And we found there's not only a trend in women wearing jewelry when they work out, when they play sports, there's professional athletes that wear watches and, and earrings and everything. So the second thing is that there's a huge still to this day, for some reason, a huge inequality in the funding and grassroots um, encouragement that girls, young girls are getting to play sports. And we know the benefits of sports are endless. There's teamwork, leadership, hard, like dedication, understanding that when you lift the weight, you get the muscle that equals what you want it to, to equal. And there's still a big, big, big inequality with, for women. So we felt like jewelry would be the best transition into that. And it, it's a purpose driven brand. So like we're going to be donating a large portion of everything that we do into grassroots communities that funding women in sport, and then also highlighting the WNBAs and the FIFA, the, the women's FIFA and the March madness for women and all of the different stuff. So highlighting what, what could become, and then also bringing up girls into sport to teach them everything else that's sport doesn't matter. It's all the leadership and teamwork skills that you can learn. So that's why jewelry, it was like, it was the, the and it's going to be a women's baseline. Um, but we, we want to create something that we can get to the most amount of masses you, possible. You're going to need a different website for it's, jewelry. Yeah. So it's, this is fully, um, it's going to be its own brand standalone. I, I am, I'm one of the co-founders and the creative directors. It's called every heart. 
So oh, right now oh. on, on Instagram and everything, it's called at every heart. Um, and the whole concept is that we want to be able to touch every and, and help every girl, every woman, that every heart. So that's that's the old, that's the concept. And of course, it's, it's women based jewelry, but uh, men can wear as well. I was going to say you should make it like rich. Richardi bling. <laughs> it's all very fine, dainty uh, gold and diamonds for women. So it's, I mean, bling well, then, might well, work. Then, well, then, then you should call it precious Richardi. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted, that was the second thing is that I wanted to build something that lived past me and, and, and was, was, it is an extension of me. Cause like literally the heart is featured in every single piece. Um, and it's inspired by my artwork. Each is that piece, from the beginning? Sorry. Is that from the very beginning? Yeah. So uh, there would never be a, a original piece of yours without a heart somewhere in it. Oh, my paintings? Oh no no no! They, they, that was about four years ago. Oh yeah yeah yeah! All my originals, like uh, they my real 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 back originals. Um, no, they don't have hearts. Those ones are gonna be the fun ones in the Sotheby's auction in like ten. Those are years. heartless. Those are heartless. <laughs> yeah. No, those actually had the most depth and the most heart. I was at the like the worst part of my painting was when I was trying to make something beautiful. Yeah, but ironic, ironically, ironically. You know, years from now, yeah, the the ones that bring the most amount of money are the ones that don't have any heart. Yeah, it's just crazy. Because because there wasn't I mean, many of them. And were... So people will be like, you know, hey man, I'm trying to get a Richard, an original, a heartless original. Richard. Yeah, heartless. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, and that makes just the value go up because there's more with the heart than there is without it. Yeah, yeah. No, I like it. You know, one time you ever heard of Peter Mac? Yeah. One time I was selling art in a gallery. You're an art salesman. Yeah. What? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, and there was a no. It was Bill was Mac, a, not Peter Mac. There's Peter Max. Uh, was, is that yeah? Peter oh. Max. But no, we did sell Peter Max, but Bill Mac. Okay. I, I'm he not did familiar. like bar relief. Okay. You know. Was it on a cruise ship? No. Oh, okay. There's they both those artists sell big on cruise ships galleries. But anyway, sorry. Go yeah. On. No, this was this was over here at the forum shops at Caesars. Oh, cool. The it, it, it's a ball relief sculpture painting type thing. So it's like, it's, you know, comes out, but I noticed in this one piece, cause he always did these girls, female bodies. And, you know, I noticed in this one piece that there was a hair in the painting, like a hair in the painting and Bill Mack or yeah, Bill Mack came in for the, for a show. And I said, uh, you know, is this supposed to be here? And he walk, walked over there and he said, that's not supposed to be there. That must have fell out. Wow. You know, of yeah. my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that that that's that's my hair when I was making that piece. I didn't know that was there. <laughs> and a couple saw that dude and bought it just because it had because it had the hair. That's yeah. so cool. Just because it had old Bill Max hair. Yeah, in that's it. cool. Yeah, different things like that are always really interesting in art. What are what artists inspire you? Any? Yeah, my my favorite artist of all time is a gentleman by the name of Julian Schnabel. He's uh, he's an artist that did plain. He was in the same era of, of Basquiat and Warhol. Um, Basquiat would be the, you know, he could, because his artwork is so popularized now with modern culture. Um, he'd be definitely somebody I look to Basquiat and Warhol. But Schnabel did a bunch of different types of artwork. He created these plate paintings. He created paintings on film. He did all these different things, but it was all so so unique and 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 so beautiful. A lot of very abstract, but very, there was some elements of the realism mixed in and it was such a cool thing. And I remember my uncle was an artist who unfortunately passed away when I was in college, but you know, he never pursued art full time. It wasn't, it wasn't his thing. He was just a passionate artist. So I remember going to the galleries in the art gallery of Ontario. And when I was young with him and seeing the, these large schnobbles in the museums and I was like, I, I want to do this one day. And like now I was seven or eight years old. And I think I'm, I could, I could, I want to be, I want to be schnobble. And that's, um, that's the, uh, He's my biggest inspiration for sure. Have you ever seen his bobbleheads? No. Oh yeah, I got several. They're called Schnabel Bobble. No. no just, just, <laughs> I was like, wait, I need these. What? Just joking, no, but that but that'd be cool because it rhymes that with Schnabel. Cool. <laughs> um, if there's artists listening to yeah. this podcast right now, what and and they haven't made it yet, they're just kind of starting out, or they've been doing it a long time, but they're not really getting anywhere. What would you say to them? Yeah. So I think there's, there's two big things and, and we touched upon it early, which is that you have to do a lot. Um, I, it sounds so simple in anything in business. And we go back to content, but specifically with art, you, there's never the right piece. There's never a painting, which is the, it, we, we can't have a one hit wonder in art. It's not like music where you just put one and it goes all over the charts and everyone loves that one painting. It's, it's gotta be the evolution of so much that you do that creates 
what you are as an artist. And then because of that, people can buy into that vision. So the second thing is that you, we can't be scared of selling our paintings. A big thing that's, I, I truly believe it's promoted in art school is that we paint for paint's sake, but like selling it's the, we're the devil, right? And then that's why like, you know, you sell out or anything like that. We, we can't be worried about that. We have to, we're doing painting. And if you're just selling it to fund the next painting, we have to be comfortable with that. Um, and then, and then the, the last thing is you, literally you truly have to love the piece you're doing because if your heart goes into it not to be cliche with the heart that i use but if your heart and love and desire goes into each of those paintings somebody will connect with it and i think that's the the number one thing people do paintings that they think the market would like and i i see a lot of that with young artists and i mean there's there definitely been times in my career where i've tried a painting because that seems what to be hot at the moment or it's like very or moment based like i'm gonna like i i'm gonna do something that happened in the media two days ago because that's what's hot right now there's no longevity to that and no way to actually build a career off of that so it has to be you can't just be doing paintings for the market you gotta do paintings for yourself and then secondly we'll find a place in the market for it and then utilizing you know social media and and video and content to then find that market like it's we know what it's the metrics are there. The math is the math. The more you put out, the better chance. And if I do a hundred paintings, and I sell two. That's a good, that's a good ratio. That's all good. If I reach out to a hundred paintings, hundred people to show in my gallery and two say, yes, that's a win. So that's, that's the biggest thing that I want artists to take away and, and young creatives that we have to do a lot and we have to be consistent. Paintings that haven't sold. Um, yeah. What yeah, do you yeah. do with them? They're in my studio. Like why I'd be a I, bunch why, of, why don't like, I, why don't you just mark them down and I'll buy them. <laughs> <laughs> we can make something if work. If nobody's bought them. We, we can make something work. Something's yeah, better than nothing. Yeah, that's, no, that is right. That is right. I, um, a, a lot of times, because I do so many different shows, if a painting doesn't sell, I'll bring it back into my studio. Um, and then we can either repurpose it for a different show. But there are some times where I may fall out of love with a painting. Like I, I've looked at it for long enough in my studio. No one's really shown interest. And I'm like, nah, this painting isn't it. And if I don't. Dude, and, if I, I, be, I bet you a million dollars. If you go home to your studio and you take those paintings that, that didn't and you take a picture and you put them on a wall and you make a special section that's called f like freaking, you know, nobody wanted them. <laughs> People will buy them. Yeah, no, I, I love the concept. And those could be your heartless collection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even if they have a heart. Even if they have you a heart. You call them heartless because the heartless no, no one nobody love. fucking no wanted them. No one love. <laughs> No, I love that. And dude, I'm telling you, there's people that probably love your paintings. They can't afford them, but they yeah. would, they would take one that, that maybe was a little bit yeah. less. And since, you know, I don't know if that art, I don't believe it does. I think, you know, art is worth what you can get someone to pay for it. For sure. So when someone says, you know, well, that's, they those sell for 20,000. Well, there's a bunch of people that would have bought it, but they didn't have 20,000. Yeah. So you say what well, didn't sell. Well, it didn't sell to somebody with 20,000. Yeah. It would have sold to somebody for 2000 and then someone says, yeah, but then, but then how do you know? Well, that's what you do. I would do if I were an artist, I would make all my shit. It's a specific collection. I would just make it all. And then, you know, I'd price it way up there and see how many of them sell. And then yeah. the ones that don't, I put back in my studio. And after a certain amount of time, I'd just post them over here and be like, have at them because yeah. it's money, dude. Yeah. No, I, every one of those are, are money. The question is, is how much? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll, I be, I'll bet you, if you put that up there, they would sell. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with it. And, and one thing I've done to tap into the market of someone that doesn't want to spend or can't $20,000 or even $5,000 is I have done limited edition print releases. So like tw twice, three times a year, I'll take one of those paintings that hasn't sold, turn it into a print. And then from that print, I'll sell like on, on lithograph, on canvas, whatever it may be at 200, 250, $300 a print. And now I can sell a couple hundred. But now not only am I in 300 new homes, um, but now it's an attainable price point for people. So that's sort of how I've combated that. But I do like the concept of, um, of potentially just having it in a separate category. Also, like if you create a print and then just take paint and splash it yeah, or it, throw an art, a, a heart on it to where the, it is an original print. Yep. That's, that's actually what I do. I make them hand embellished. They're all one of ones at that point. That's right. Yeah. That yeah. I, that's what I do. Value. Yeah. Cause you know, I You're like, an artist. you know, you, well, know like, you know, the whole system. You I got like it. shit that's original. Yeah. Like I don't want a, a poster. Yeah. I call them posters. You yeah, call them that's prints. That's what they are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fucking poster. dude. <laughs> yeah. That's a poster of the, of the original. Like I don't want the 
I want, I, I, I like original Yeah. to where that's the only one there is. And, yep. and I don't even like it when artists make similar ones like bitch, make <laughs> one. That's the one. That's well, you it. have to pay a lot more. Well, for sure an you artist. do. That, that's the only big thing. That's yeah, the but thing. that's, that's, that's what, you know, what it is. That's There's what the ballers for are for. That's what they're for. Wasting money. <laughs> hundred dollars worth of canvas, hundred dollars worth of paint, a little bit of time and boom. It's worth a hundred G's. Yeah, there's a lot of artists that way less than time that spend on on paper. Well, Basquiat's a perfect example. A lot of his artwork, Jean Michel Basquiat, a lot of his artwork was found garbage that he splashed on, like pieces of wood, tires, and like that that he splashed it on. And now they're three hundred million dollars, hundred and fifty million dollars for no a piece. Shit. Yeah, and these are like these are so to talk about like that's why you always is he dead. He's dead. Yeah, he he passed away. He was he died at at twenty eight from a heroin overdose. So dude, if was, you got three hundred million dollars to to buy a piece of artwork, dude, it's you, pretty crazy. You world. got way too much money. Yeah, <laughs> like three hundred million. Yeah, there's paintings that have been. I mean, because you know when someone buys one of those, that's not all their money. Of course not. That's yeah, just, that's just, that's just like think. Yeah, it's crazy. Holy shit, three hundred yeah. million dollars. What's the most you've ever got for a painting? Uh, like my biggest piece was about fifty five thousand. Um, but like a, that would be like an eight, five, eight foot piece. Does it feel good getting that cash? Yeah. It feels awesome. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah. It's awesome. So if there's people listening that own businesses, mm-hmm. homie says you're an entrepreneur cause you were working eight to five or nine to five and then you'd come home and paint till two in the morning in the freezing cold. What makes that entrepreneurial? So to me is like finding time to create something else. So what I mean by that is like everyone has, uh, in theory, everyone has a job if, if they're working and they want, you know, everyone loves to complain. Our modern society is like, oh, well, I can't, everyone tells me like, I can't become an artist because I work. Like, well, you don't understand what it's like my job's like. I'm like, okay, I do. Cause I worked in finance for a, a real estate investment fund, which wasn't, although I liked the people I worked with, it wasn't fun. And I was sitting at a desk all day, crunching numbers on Excel, but I wanted to find something and break out of that. So with the entrepreneurship side of it comes in is that I didn't make excuses at night and weekend. So on top of that, because I graduated, with, I had a baseball scholarship and I had a, a, a talent to coach baseball because I, I liked it. Um, in between that, I was doing baseball lessons. I ran like one of the biggest baseball schools in Canada during that time, during that transition time, because I needed extra money to be able to fund the art shows. The the early art shows, I wasn't getting paid. Like I wasn't selling much art. My art was 500 bucks for a huge canvas. So I was making a couple dollars. Who decides the prices? That don't make sense. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just, well, it's the market. Has you seen that bulldog out in my conference room? Yeah. What's his name again? Shit, I should know his name. Anyway, he just does bulldogs. Okay, cool. That's like 20 G's. Yeah. What, he, what he, he gave it to me, by the way. Yeah. Um, awesome. w- which is a funny story behind that because he called me and he said, Brad, if you can get me uh, as a speaker at the NADA convention, you know, I'll make you, because I said I like original artwork. And so Very he cool. says, I'll make you a bulldog. And I said, you know, well, because I knew people there. They were a client of mine. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, I, they, they force you to, submit an application regardless. So submit an application and then I'll call and see if I can freaking pull a string or two. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay. And so we hung up and I'd say, I don't know, two months later, I totally forgot to call and, but he submitted and, and they picked him. Oh, nice. So one day he shows up, he shows up, he shows up with his painting and I'm like, and it framed and everything. And I'm like, freaking damn dude. Appreciate that. He goes, well, dude, you, you, you got it dialed in. And, and I, and I told him, I said, dude, honestly, I did not make dude, the call. I said, you great. got that's in awesome. on a hundred percent on your own. That's and he awesome. said, well, you can still have it. No, that's awesome. Because it says light speed on it. Yeah. So like it wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, it was else. going, it was, it was coming here. So yeah, no, to the pricing question, it was, you know, rewind. Now that was about 10 years ago now. So I was just charging, like I, I bought a painting, it cost me 200 all in. I, I want to make 200 bucks. So I was selling for four. When, all of those sell out. I'm like, okay, well now I can charge 800 and then all of them sell out again. And now I can charge 1200. Then I, when I got started opening my own galleries, that's the other part of being an entrepreneur is that every artist historically has just gone into galleries. They just put a couple of their paintings up. I was like, well, no, I want to, I want to either buy the real estate or get a lease at a top space and figure this out. And I didn't have money at the time. I didn't, I couldn't afford these leases. So I thought of very creative strategic ideas to do with these malls Or I was like, you have a vacant space there for seven days. I'm doing a pop-up in that space. I'll give you whatever percentage you want, but let's, let's figure it out. And those, those were extremely successful in terms of 
to, to price points like okay now everything's 1200 bucks everything sells out okay now they're 5000 everything sells out and it and it was just literally when i say it's the market it was just the market is the market if i'm if i have a bunch of paintings right now at $10,000 in my gallery for my current market they'll sell out so i'm like cool well, now i got to go to 15 and then not all sell out some some do and now now i'm at just a different level of of collector they they become they're going into you can buy wall art for under five grand. Now it's like going into collections and, and, and clients like you that have big, beautiful collections and, and big, beautiful homes, where it's like, this piece is going in my collection forever. It's gonna get passed down to generations. And that's the next step of my price points. But it really is just the market. Like well, I didn't, yeah, that's it. Well, you're young though. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm not that young, but I'm 30. Don't you hate the fact that you, your stuff's worth more if you're dead? <laughs> yeah, that happens too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, everybody, my son's gonna say everybody, everybody, loves, loves, you, everybody loves you, but they're hoping you die. Yeah. Like I hope he dies. Yeah. You imagine what this will be worth when you can't make another one. Yeah, yeah. No, that is a thing. It's an unfortunate thing in, in the art world. Um, it's it's real. You're not joking. <laughs> so are you a hundred percent painter now? You don't you don't dick with uh, and jewelry, but you don't dick with side jobs, side hustles, restaurants. Um, no, I'm all, like I'm. I invest in a lot of different things, a lot of companies and startups because I just have a passion for it. Just like just my business mind that like wants to like understand different companies, but no, actively, um, it's it's gonna be jewelry and art, and that's that's what it's been for a while now. Um, we've been de developing out this jewelry line for almost a year now. Um, full, it's a it's a pretty big undertaking in terms of the production that we're doing and the scale we want to scale at. Um, so it's it's awesome, but um, but yeah, that's it's that's been my full time thing. It's for a really long time now. Did you go to Grant's house in in uh, yeah. which one? The, the new one on the, on the water. Um, the one that was right, Tommy you know, Hilfiger's? Yeah, Tommy Hilfiger's, yeah. D did he leave a lot of that Hilfiger shit going on? In what sense? Like, you know, red furry walls and just weird shit. No, not, no. Not weird, there. but like. Yeah, it, it, very eccentric for Hilfiger, yeah. yeah. Um, no, not that I saw. Grant has an incredible art collection. Yeah, did, and did, so what, he took me around all of his art collection. I got to see all the sculptures he has, all the big paintings. But I didn't see anything too crazy like that. That I would say, like, that's a little weird. Did you see that Moon Man or, you know, yeah. astronaut or whatever? Yeah, Brendan Murphy. So really cool story. Um, so that artist's name is Brendan Murphy, and he's, he's awesome. And he did a huge... The mural that I just did in Antigua at Hodges Bay, they have the biggest Brendan Murphy in the world, um, Chris Harding, who's 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 awesome. He's an art collector, world round art collector, and and runs a bunch of different businesses, and is one of the owners. He bought this huge, I think it's twenty five feet, thirty feet, like massive Moon Man that sits on the the dock at Hodges Bay. So the Moon Man looks at my mural, and my mural looks at him now, and it's really cool. So um, Grant and I were talking about that because he he just bought a bigger one actually for his house. Uh, Grant he had a eight foot now he bought like a 12 footer but it's really well cool. now he's got money that he, he don't necessarily need anymore <laughs> yeah just buy some silly stuff <laughs> yeah, you can buy some silly shit dude yeah. i met grant he, he he had money then but not the kind he has now when i met grant he was like you know he had he had a couple cool pieces but you know yeah he his collection's awesome yeah well i was i haven't been to his house in florida yet but in his condo I don't know if you went there, but I didn't know. Yeah. He, and now he's got a, that house. He just bought on, uh, in LA, in LA, yeah. Uh, Malibu. Malibu. Yeah. yeah. So like, you should be hitting him up, bro. I for sure am. They do. What yeah, kind we're of doing piece? some pieces there for sure. For sure. Yeah. Now, old, uh, what's your name? Greg. Old Greg says that made you entrepreneurial working at night. Now, yeah. Just finding a way. Yeah. But entrepreneur, just so you know, by definition is someone who takes greater than normal financial risks. Yep. <laughs> yeah. What kind of risks were you taking? So I, I mean, I, the very specific one was I was working a stable job. Like, I mean, to be totally, but you, but you, but you just came home and worked extra. That's did, not a risk. No, that singular the risk is action, quitting your job. That exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm the, the second part, but, but he was selling art. You were selling art. I, not really. I only made 1500 bucks for that, that mural. So I wasn't selling much art at that time. Like, so I'm, I had a, a job, it was a finance job. I made a hundred thousand a year, which is a fantastic salary at 23, 24 years old. I was, I, what else did I need? I didn't need anything. I was way too much money. I was living at home at the time. And to go to an art sales by that point, collectively over the last six years combined was probably 15,000. So when I, when I did take that leap or I was like, I, I, the night I closed on my first house and the week of my wedding, I was like, 
if I'm ever going to do this, I'm going to do this now. And I didn't take any backup. I didn't work a side job. I didn't work anything to make some money just to try to get by. I'm like, I'm going to give everything into this and I'm going to figure out how to make it work from there. And that's, so the, the financial risk was like, I had no guarantee or anything like to, to do. Obviously there was no gallery backing me. I had no finances on the back end, nobody helping me. And it was like, and obviously my parents and family and friends are super supportive, but they're also like, are you crazy? Like, what are you talking about? Obviously now they're all supportive, but at, back then it was like, and not that they didn't support me and, you know, follow your dreams, Anthony, but it was like, you're about to get married, about to close on a house and you're about to take up. I really in theory quit for 1500 bucks. You're like, are you sure? Like, are, are, is everything okay? And so that was the, the risk. But <clears throat> the second part of the amount of risk is that all the galleries that I've done have been hundred percent funded and financed by me. And I, they're with no guarantee. And every, I've done a lot of different gallery shows. The, the shows that I've done by myself in, in Miami, like pre pre grant. Um, how do you advertise for the show? How do people know that that's there? Greg and I with flyers went up and down Collins Avenue with saying, I have a show at the Pelican Hotel on, in Miami Beach, which was like a little, not really pretty hotel. This is, this is six, five, six years ago, but that's what I did. I just literally hand to hand combat. I was like, Hey, I'll come to my show. Let's do this. And that's what I did when I got into the malls, um, into like the, you know, the, the nicer malls in Toronto. I was like, I have a space, but like, let me get out. And, hey guys, you want to come see my artwork? And this literally just all the time that I was spending at work, which was 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. working in finance, I just transferred that into promotion for my artwork because I didn't stop painting that time. Just all promo on the back end. Can I ask something real quick? Is that okay? Um, so when he got into Yorkdale Mall, which is the, so he can talk on this more, but when he got into Yorkdale Mall, he was not big in Toronto's art scene. Yeah. Like there's big artists in Toronto. He was not big. People have been trying to get in there. Artists that had presence and like were successful have been trying to get in that mall for a long time. And he got in. And so everybody's walking in like, dude, who are you? How did you yeah. get in here? It's because he's a businessman. Like, his entrepreneurial spirit this, was like... This dude's your manager. He's my man. I've seen it. I've, I've known this guy since we were... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. Know, he was old in college. And like, in college, he was buying uh, jewelry. Go back to jewelry. He was buying art pieces off Alibaba, putting his own logo on it, and selling them around school. Yeah. At like 19 years old. And yeah. this. Everybody had one for 20 bucks. This guy's over here. Probably invested everything he had. As yeah, yeah I didn't have much. Money, he invested in buying yeah. his products from... China getting him shipped over and flipped it for two grand. Like he's just been a serial entrepreneur his whole life. Business man. Yeah. And I, I tried to be, thank you, Greggy. That's uh, I, I'll give him the tip later, but no, <laughs> no, but no, the, to go back to the Yorkdale started, like it was always about being, I think of myself as a creative entrepreneur because I wanted to understand how to get into these malls. And I know like they have space. So I said, what if we just do a three day pop-up? And they're like, there's nothing really to lose. I'm going to spend everything. I got to decorate this whole thing. I gotta, it's bare walls. I'm going to have to do, if I had, 15,000 to my name, I was spending 17, and I don't have credit cards or whatever, I was spending 17,000 on this gallery because I knew it was going to be beautiful. And then when the three days go well, they, Yorkdale came back to me, they're like, oh, you want to extend to seven days? And that seven days turned into a five-year gallery because just because of the the concept that I brought and we, we moved it to a few different locations, which was awesome. And now I'm in a, a few other ones, but that, yeah, like taking financial risk is all called? I do. This is Anthony Ricciardi Art Gallery. So um, if someone's well, walking through the mall, they see it, they'll say, yeah, hey, Anthony that's Ricciardi. that dude. Yeah, that's that's that guy. And I did one called that I did a collaboration with the mall. Uh, it was called Dream Space. And what that concept was, was you walked into it. It looked like a regular gallery. Then you walked behind like a, a sort of hidden door-ish. And it opened up to this 2,000 square foot, like all grass and, and these big paintings. Well, they were paintings. They were installations that people got to walk into my artwork. So there's a lot of them. There's, there's actually one here in, in Vegas and there's actually a few all over like the museum of ice cream and different like people take pictures in front of ice cream and stuff like that. So I did that, but with large installations of my artwork, like, so to, to reference the Benjamin Franklin painting in my, in my history in finance, I made a huge pool full of hundred dollar, like fake hundred dollar bills and coins where people can jump into like Scrooge McDuck and, and do stuff like that. So I made all my pieces like 3d, but 3d and people can walk into. So that was all funded by me, right? Like I just like, I, that, at, at each of those times, every dollar that I've had, I've put every dollar into because I, you know, I didn't have the, the system yet that was sort of working. Um, so I had to just keep reinvesting, keep figuring it out. And I was, my wife and I look at each other like, all right, we're going to make this work. Let's put our head down and go. Now you need to do a piece, this is called hearts and balls. <laughs> Because you've had ba baseball, no balls. Oh, because I've had balls. Oh, okay, yes. It takes balls to put, to yeah, risk 100%. every dollar, not yeah. knowing As that you you're going to get it back. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. That's awesome. What do you think of those guys? Like again, because sometimes, like you know, 
number one, Tony Curtis. You remember that actor? And the name, yeah. He's an older actor. Yeah, yeah, he was name. an art. When I was selling art, Tony Curtis came in. We, oh, cool. He had his, but he took a folder I had and he sketched out these little, you know, sketches and signed it. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, that's going to be worth something someday. How do you know, you know, if it's worth anything? It's what they do. Cause if he start, if he kept doing that or was promoting that he does that, it'd be worth something. I, I don't know if you know the story about Picasso in the coffee shop. It's the most, it's the best story ever, but he was in a coffee shop in France and someone comes up to him and says, can you sketch on this, on this napkin? And he goes like this and he goes, that'll be 50,000. She's like, what? It took you one second. He's like, no, this took me my lifetime to build to this. And I think that's because he created that. And that's like, and the confidence level of that is like, the, I'm very conf confident to say like my paintings are 20,000 now, but they will be 50 very soon because of what I'm going to put into it. So Tony Curtis may have just stopped putting things into it. And that just eventually just drops off. When they're 50, does my piece go up in value? Of course. Uh, hopefully more. Because, because like you're saying, and that's probably why you won't sell them cheaper because if, if, Someone will be like, well, I'll just go get his Heartless collection. Yeah, you want, like, the whole goal, and honestly, my whole goal is, like, everyone who's always bought paintings, the people that bought $5,000 paintings, I'm very happy to say now, like, if we want to go into the open market to sell it, they can get twenty four, and that's a great return. But my real goal is, like, when they start selling for two hundred fifty to 500000 at Sotheby's, in a not long time from now, you'll be able to say, like, yeah, man, maybe I will sell it. Maybe not. I, I you, still wouldn't sell you it. You wouldn't sell it. Like, you personally... Some people may want to or whatever it may be, but it's cool to know that art does have that collectible value in future interest if the artist keeps going. And there's been a ton of, and what I mean by keep going is, dying is one thing that can speed it up, but keep going because they keep innovating, they keep pressing, 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 and figuring out new things to do to hit into the market and to continue to expand. So I think that's the main goal. What do you say to those guys that just go get canvas and do bullshit? Like again, give me some paint and some canvas. Yeah. I'm going to make a pile of shit. I don't, I don't get the colors. It's subjective. Some of you might see it and love it. I, I what love about, it. What about the ones that like, they have no, like yours, you can see things like you can actually, like just abstract you can splashes, actually you mean, just like someone yeah, just like, splashes. Just stupid. So, I mean, there's Jackson Pollock's who's just, who's the, one of the founders or the creators of just, just splashes, like just splashes. And those paintings are in the hundreds of millions. See, that's so that's what I don't get. I um, could have done that. I know then you, you got to go do it. That's my art. That's my thing. When artists say, is it, is, me, it, when, is it like, is it like color mac mixing? No, it's definitely like, not. No, it's, it's not subject. It's not that the at way all. You it's, put white and yellow and green together with no. the splashes and the splashes are just beautiful. The way he went. Yeah, no, it's not that. Cause like, think about like Damien Hirst, who's one of the, the probably top three richest living artists. In the, every one of his paintings is about a million bucks or, or way more. He has prints that are a singular red dot or six dots, like they're just dots. He openly doesn't paint any of them. He has a team that paints for him. So he he's the architect of his paintings, but he's known as one of the most famous painters of all time. So to say that red singular dot on a white piece of paper um, is worth a million bucks is because he's created that market for himself. And a lot of it, unfortunately, goes down into marketing and to like, why do it? So the, the answer to everyone, you know, we have people, I've had being in an open concept gallery where people can just walk in and talk to me, like, I can do that. This sucks. I'm like, then go do it. Build this entire career. No, right? Your That's shit the, doesn't suck. You need to. No. You, you need to be an artist to make stuff like that. Well, there, there's artists. I, I okay. How about this? I go into museums and I see a splash of canvas. And I go, that sucks. I could do that, but I'm not in that museum yet, so I really can't say that. So it's a, it's a tricky thing, and there's so many factors, and obviously to get to different levels like that where a, a splash is worth a million bucks, um, there's a lot of factors at play. Well, dude, I'm glad you came in. I'm glad, I'm glad you stopped by. Yeah, thank you Folks, so much. Go great. check out this dude's painting at Richiardi Paints uh, social media. Yep. Richiardi or Richardi. I always say Richie is it. No, is it it's just it's Ricciardi. C-I in Italian makes a ch sound. Richardi, Richardi yeah. Paints, R-I-C-C-I-A-R-D-I paints.com. Check out his work. How can the bomb squad support you? No, just, you know, liking and sharing. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, if, uh, I have, a, I've, the jewelry comes out in August, uh, every heart, um, will be the jewelry. Everyheart.com. Yep. Everyheart.com. And you at, got everyheart.com. Yeah. We have to pay for it. It was a little expensive. I was going to say like, and, and the I Instagram too, but it's that's good. Available. Yeah. Everyone freaked out when I said dropping bombs is available. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But droppingbombs.com folks, if you're not subscribed, go subscribe. Go subscribe. Yeah. Go to everyheart.com. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you so folks, much. Folks, as always till next time, keep it real. Thank you. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.